I'm happy to see BME. And I wonder if my sister, are you pregnant again? Because actually, the last time I saw her, she, we were standing by the door, and she said we should pray. Say for what? She said uh, she's suspecting a baby. I look at her again, you don't look pregnant. She didn't look anywhere near pregnant then. So never trust this woman. Maybe another one is coming in a short while. The Lord bless you. I want to share with you today, and I'll be reading first from Matthew chapter 3, verse 16. The Lord give us grace, and you are here next week. I'll be continuing this same topic, the second chapter. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lightning upon him. Are you there? Then verse 17. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. I'm sure all of us have heard a message or the other from this same scripture, or perhaps you read it on your own. And I'm not going to try to do a treatise on the whole uh, subject matter. I'm only going to touch on something that happened to Jesus here as significant. The Bible says, and the heavens were what? Were opened unto him. Say with me, may the heavens be opened unto me. I say it again. I see all over the place people have conventions and they have seminars and they call it Open Heaven. Anybody attended anyone like that? A seminar called Open Heavens, Open Heavens Everywhere. And I just want us to understand what it means to have Open Heavens. At the back of your mind, place this. That God originally intended for man to dwell with him. Do you know that? The original intention of God is that man does what? That man would dwell with him. He created man, he placed man in the Garden of Eden, and he will come down, according to the Bible, in the cool of the day, to have fellowship with man. That is the original intention. But as you continue to read the Bible, you will see at a particular point, God and man were separated. God and man were separated. The Bible says somewhere in Genesis, it said, and men began to call on the name of the Lord. That was after the birth of Seth. When Seth was born, men started to call upon the name of the Lord. This means that relating with God therefore become a choice that some make and some didn't. Someone had to call upon God, some wouldn't. And those that call upon him, he himself chose to do what? To relate with. He has relationship with man. As men call upon him, as men live within his mandate, as men pleased him. It is therefore significant that before Jesus Christ of Nazareth, my Lord and King, could do any meaningful work on earth, something has to happen. What was it? The heaven has to open above him. Open heaven therefore means that the barrier between man and God is removed on the head of an individual. Since we all stay here, are you still listening? Since we are all here, I might be bad, he might be good. He might be pleasing God, I might be displeasing God. God, therefore, has a system by which the same heaven that we all see, blue sky or dark sky or white sky or sunny day, that same heaven, unto some might be opened and unto some might be closed. I don't know if you're catching it. So there could be a hundred of us under the same sky, living in the same arena, same area, all of us enjoying the same kind of weather, the sun shining in season, the rain coming down in season, dew settling down on all of us together. Yet, 
God is pleased with some and God is displeased with some. And unto those he is pleased with, the heavens above them open. And the same sky. You won't see it open. It's not like you're watching a TV. But then you will notice it in the life of the individual. Whether he's walking under open heavens or otherwise. Let me show you. The man unto whom the heavens are open is the man unto whom the strength of the heavens are available for his life. And the man unto whom the heavens are closed is the man who has to do everything himself. Can I repeat myself? If a man has the heaven opened above him, it means God is in union with him. What he does, God do. They are working together. Are you with me? The heavens opened above him means the strength of the heavens are available unto the man. Some call it grace. I said they are right. Others call it favor. I said they are right. Whatever name you give unto it, this man is not walking alone. He moves, God moves. Or God moves, he moves. Whichever way you like it. They're doing it together. They're in school together. They look for a job together. They sleep together. God watches over him in his sleep. Does the Bible not say that he gives his beloved sleep? So even sleeping takes grace, takes favor. Are you here with me? Open heavens is the strength of the heavens made available to man. And it is not something that you can take for granted. It's either there or it's not there. Jesus Christ, Son of God, Messiah of mankind, come to do a very big job, God with God, yet, in the form of man, before he can make a success, something has to happen. What was it? The heavens has to open above him. The heavens has to open above him. Here in this room right now, this same ceiling that I don't like very much, one day we're going to change it, but this same ceiling over all of us, it's just there. I can't say with a guarantee that we are all walking on open heavens. I can't. I would love to say so. That would make it nice. But I can say that there is a style of life that we can live that can make the heavens open above us. But when the heavens are open, Moses, when the heavens are open, you don't need to announce it. When the heavens open upon a man, all men will know that over him the heavens are open. Are you with me? When the heavens opened above the Lord Jesus, the whole of Judea came. Didn't they? All over Nazareth, everywhere, everywhere he went. His fame grew, grew in bounds until the Greeks came. And the Greeks came and they said, hello, we want to see Jesus. And this is the peak of his career. When people from Greece came all over to come and see the man Jesus, who never left Judea. He never left Judea. And they came to see him. And the Bible says, the Greeks came. They approached Philip. They say, hey, master, we will want to see Jesus. We want to see the image the size, we want to see the looks of this man whose fame went beyond Judea all the way to Greece. Do you know, I like to read secular history written around the time of the Bible. And there's one called the Apocrypha. You know Pontius Pilate? You know what happened to him? He committed suicide. That's the history of it. You know why he committed suicide? He came before Caesar. And they told Caesar that Pontius Pilate asked that a man be crucified. What's his name? Jesus of Nazareth. Why was he crucified? What do you know about him? They told Caesar everything Jesus did. And Caesar now asked Pilate, and you crucify such a man? A man was doing such things and you don't think you need to tell me before you kill him. Therefore, demote him. Who was demoted? Pontius Pilate was demoted for killing Jesus Christ much, much later in his career. 
And because of the demotion according to history, he went and he committed suicide. Even beyond his death. Hmm? When Caesar had, Caesar shook at the memory of a man called Jesus. Why? Because the heavens above him were open. Say with me, open heavens. If you're here next week, I'll be pushing it a bit further. But today, I want to show you three factors that guide open heavens. And then I'm going to read a scripture that you won't like. Factors for open heavens. Number one factor for open heavens is the center of God's will. The center of God's will. When the heaven opens upon a man, did I not say it is because the strength of the heavens are made available for that man? What I need to add is the strength of the heavens are made available to that man for the fulfillment of the will of the heavens. Let me repeat myself. The heavens open. Why? To give the strength of the heavens to man for a purpose. What's the purpose? That that man be enabled to fulfill the will of the heavens. If he is not in the will of the heavens, he is going to be sustained but not enlarged. Did you hear me? Many of us are sustained. We are being managed. We are not being enlarged. We are not having what we should have because we are not placed where we should be. I tell you, if you were a father, extremely wealthy, and you send your son to Canada in Manitoba, and you want him to go to Manitoba University, and you send money, and you send money, and you send money, and suddenly you get here that the guy is not in Manitoba, he's in Niagara, having fun. Women, and wine, and drinks, and stuff. Will you continue to send money? Will you? Because to send further money to that child will be to what? To sustain him in what you do not want. He is not in the center of your will. For the center of your will is in Manitoba University. That's your desire for your son. If he's not in the center of your will, investing strength and money on him is of two Two calamities. Number one, you sustain him in error. Number two, you destroy his future. And for these two, two calamities, you send nothing. Somebody might come and say, the boy is suffering. You're likely, if you're a good parent, to say, let him suffer. But dear Lord, don't let him die. You will pray to manage him. Not pray to enlarge him. Because it's not in the center of your will. Are you with me? Jesus Christ should not be baptized. Are you there? Because he is king of kings and lord of lords. The Bible says to me that by him were all things made that was made. And without him was nothing made that was made. He happens to be the maker of John the Baptist. He knew John knew. And when he got to John, John said, Baby, I don't, I don't think I'm fit to baptize you. You know what he said? He said, Suffer for things to be so. We must obey it to the letter. Obedience was so primal to Christ that I didn't think it was bringing him down, humbling him to be baptized by John the Baptist. When obedience mattered that way, it places you in the center of God's will. The very first factor guiding is the center of his will. It's not of passion. It's not of you like or you don't like. It's of the fact that you want to do the will of the Father. And somebody might be getting confused. 
How do I know his will? Are you thinking like that? How then do I know his will to be there? That is factor two. Factor two is obedience. Obedience will always get you to the center of God's will. Say that with me. Obedience will always get you to the center of God's will. You don't, you see, I've been pastoring now for close on 30 years, and in 30 years I've been almost everywhere. <clears throat> Somebody last week was asking me if I want to take a job. She said the job would take me everywhere. I said, I don't want to take that job because I've been everywhere already. <laughs> I've met the black, I've met the yellow, I've met the white, I've met them all. And I realized all men are the same. Don't mind the color. Hmm? Don't mind the color. There's a natural tendency in you, Moses, to disobey. I feel same. Anybody notice that in you? You want to confess? A natural tendency in man to disobey. It is there. We, we inherited it from Adam. The intention of your natural tendency is to push you away from the will of God. That's the intention. Have you noticed that when Apple was not illegal, you can hardly find it in Nigeria? Uh-huh. Does anybody know that bringing in foreign fruits is illegal now? It is. Yet you are going to see South African uh, pears. You are going to see apple everywhere. Because there is a tendency in man to disobey. Once there is a law, you go against it. That tendency is a flesh. Notice that disobedience, therefore, by my own qualification, is whatever pushes you away from the will of your father. Disobedience does that. So the father says, do this so that you be in my will. Your body says, I don't like it. So, let me tell you what I've been trying to say in one sentence. Nobody likes obedience. Anybody agree with me? doesn't come naturally. I don't like it. I am a naturally rebellious individual. Do do we have my type in the house? But for me, for me to disobey is what is natural. I don't like laws. You tell me sit down, something me want to stand up. Actually, I might sit down before the law comes. But if you say sit down, I wonder why should I sit down? Number one, why should I obey you? And so I have this natural tendency. And whenever you yield to that natural tendency, I can tell you, I can tell you without shaking that it is taking you out of the will of the Father. Disobedience will take you out. Factor two is obedience. Factor one is being in the center of the will of God. Factor two is obedience. Factor one and two are close together because it's only obedience that can put you in the center of God's will. The center of God's will. A man and a woman were dating and they got married. And so they started having problems. And so they came to me. So I asked the young woman, did you marry the will of God? She said, yes. You're sure it was God who instituted this marriage? She said, yes. Then why you guys sleeping together before you got married? He said, yes. I said, I don't think it was God. Now, you may not like me, but that's the truth. When you do it your way, you will still be there to manage it. Did you hear me? Because it's a merciful father. But you better know when you are being managed and when you are being established. You know, there are two different things. When God has his duty as a loving father to manage an errant son. I am a father and I got boys. And I say to you, friends, managing boys is a task. It's more so when they start to grow this thing, you know? And when they are taller than you are, when you have to lift up your head to say, hey, do it. He looks down at you and says, what? <laughs> and even you, you are careful the way you say the next word. <laughs> you don't want brother to be too angry. All of them are taller than me. There they stand and I'm looking at them. Even the youngest one, about a couple of days came and he said, Daddy, couple of years. In a couple of years. And I look at him, in a couple of years, really he will be taller. You know what the first one said, what the Shalom said to me? He said, I used to think you are a tall man. And that's an insult, isn't it? He was standing next to me. He said, Daddy, I used to think. So suddenly looking from above, 
he realized. So when you are rearing a son that is errant, hmm, you will know it's a hard task to manage. But when you have a son who is not errant, he is so easy to establish. Are you getting it? So uh, my, my problem with you is, I don't know, are you giving God a hard task? It's easy for God to do what? To establish you. If you are not errant. But if you are errant, he has the very difficult task of doing what? Of managing you. Of managing you. So the problem with being managed is you eat, Abby, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You move around, you wear clothes, probably you buy a car. But since you are not getting established and you are not getting expanded, it means the heavens are managing you in mercy. God does not want to manage you in mercy. He wants to be such a person over whom he can smile. You hear what he said about Jesus? He said, this is my well, beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. You know, at one point he said, you guys, listen to him. He didn't say listen to me, he said listen to him. You know, he said that mountain of transfiguration. He said, you hear him, hear ye him. What is God saying? You can, you can leave me alone. Whatever he says is what I'm saying. I trust him. Whatever instruction he gives unto you, follow. I love him. I wish that the Lord would be able to look at me one day and say, this is my well beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased. That is open heaven. Factor one is what? The center of God's will. Factor two is what? Hmm? Factor three is God's timing. Factor three for open heavens is what? God's time. <clears throat> now, Brother Peter, I might stop anytime, so we'll continue next week. But just want to get the three. Number one is what? Center of God's will. If you're in the center of God's will, you can be sure. Whenever the heavens will open. It will open. One year, I'm waiting. Two years, I'm waiting. You are 70, I'm waiting. Jesus Christ himself waited for how long? For 30 years before the heavens opened. 30 years, do you know when you read the secular history? I was reading somewhere where Mary sent Jesus to go and fetch water. That is the mother. Secular history, they call it the apocrypha. I like to read it. I just like to read what happened around that cycle. They sent him to go and fetch water. And I think it was when he was playing. And as a child, he didn't want to, but he had to. You understand? And as I was reading it, I was thinking, so the Lord had my problem. Even as a human being. He himself was sent on errands that he really, really would not have wanted to obey. So he learned obedience. Are you getting it? Did you hear what I said? Jesus Christ did what? He learned obedience. And learning obedience put him where? In the very center of God's will. May you learn obedience. Amen. Don't ever forget what I said. Your mommy has been calling you fine boy from when you were a child. Are you getting me? Your wife called you handsome man now. So it can bloat your head, isn't it? But in this handsome piece of flesh, it's a disobedient machine. Have you noticed it? Something in you that wants to go against the will of the Father. is there. Wherever you are, however fine you look, I know it's there. If I can't see it, I know it's hiding. And that tendency will always take you out of the will of the Father. And in the wilderness, the heavens can never open. For the heavens will open when you are in the center of God's way. Number two is obedience, which I said, necessary. Work against your natural tendency. What the Bible says, do. Do. Yesterday, around 9.30, my wife called me. They are reading Revelation. The entire family is reading Revelation. So yesterday, they read the last chapter of Revelation. And she said, Wale, there's something the children are asking you. I said, what is it? That, why is lying? Well, they are mentioning the sins that will take people to hell. And lying is part of it. That one of the children asked her, lying is such a little sin, why should L be the punishment for lying? Uh, 
Okay, okay. I said, give the child the phone. So I will tell him. When you lie, when you lie, are you listening? When you lie, any lie, however little, you are buying directly into Satan. For lying is a product that only Satan can produce. It comes from nowhere else. That is why it is the greatest of all sins in my books. And the easiest, the easiest to commit. Why? Because, you know, the, Jesus kindly said it. He kindly said it, so we understand. He said he's a liar from the beginning, Abi. And he's what? The father. The what? The what? The father. The father of what? Not liars. All lies. So every lie is a direct descendant of who? Of Satan. So when you lie, you lie, you are in the company of a direct descendant of Satan. And that is why when they mention sins that take you to hell, they never miss out on lie. They say, and no liar, huh? no liar will enter the kingdom of the Father. So what happened, Moses? When I said, can I have one naira? And you said, I have no money. And you got a thousand. Hmm? You call it white lie. They ever know it's lie. I want Christians, listen to me. I want Christians to be so bold to say, I got a thousand, but I can't spare a naira. And whatever... Listen to, I, this is how I live. I'm only asking you to try. It doesn't matter. Stand on your head. Do somersaults. Whatever. I got a thousand. But I can't spare a naira. Ask Bolade. How many times he's come for money and I'll be counting money. And he said, Daddy, so, so, so. I said, no. Because the money here does not have your name on it. It's not coming to you. I don't have to lie. Why would I say I don't have money when I have money? I have money, but I don't have your money. Can you speak to somebody like that? Because you are a child of your father, in whom there is no shadow of turning. Do you understand it? You are God's son. He doesn't turn. There's no change. With God, it is white. With Satan, it is black. Black and white together does not exist in Christianity. You want to hear me? I want Christians to be like that. Somebody was teaching along this line somewhere in Port Harcourt. Where's my lawyer friends? And he said, therefore we have to pray for lawyers. <laughs> I said, don't stop at lawyers, pray for policemen too. <laughs> there are some jobs that are hazardous. We are lying, it's a virtue. But then people should realize the job is not what makes you. It's your Christianity that marks the job. That's the way the Lord wants it. The third one, like I said, is timing. Just time. If you do not be this time, you will get out of the center of His will. Hmm? Everybody standing in the center of the will of God has only one concern. What's your concern? I'm not disobeying him. But things are slow, I won't disobey him. But things are moving for others, I will not disobey him. Others are making it, I will not disobey him. Time is moving fast, people are passing you by. What you want, they're getting. There are other means, other measures, all you need to do is bend the rule a bit. I won't bend, I'm going to stand. In the center of his will, people call it foolishness. God call it faith. Can I repeat myself? Men will call it what? Foolishness. What does God call it? Faith. To see a man stand in the center of his will, refusing to bend. Why don't you do that? Just a little crooked. I won't. You are not bending too many laws. You are bending just a bit. I won't. It's not a major disobedience. Everybody's doing it. I won't. I'm going to stand here. For how long? 
Hey, only one answer for that. When you're driving towards Fagba and you get to the traffic light and it shows red, what do you do? You stop. When do you move? You beat, you beat the dictation of the, of the traffic light. Do the same for God. Stand there. God is not doing anything. It misses what? It's red light. You wait. When there's green light, all men will see it. It's good for marriage. It's good for businesses. Hey, I've seen men wait before. I've seen women wait before. Others are getting married. They are refusing to bend. No, 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 no. I saw a lady. She's in Samanda. I knew her in my youth. One of those girls that did my eye twinkle, twinkle when I was looking for a woman. So I returned from England many years later. I saw her. I said, baby, you still look like you look when we were young. What happened? He said, I still look like that. I'm still not married. I looked at her. I held her. Beautiful, fantastic job. I said, what do you think is happening? He said, I do not know. But I'm not going to do what others are doing. He said, I'm going to wait here until it will settle me. So I look at her again. Say, you are settled already. The heavens can't bear to hear this kind of statement and not to record it. Your type, very rare. A virgin at 38, very rare. Having boyfriends who will say they want to marry her and at one point say, unless I taste, I can't purchase. And then she will just say, then go taste somewhere else. This one, you buy before you see Huh? This one, what do you do? Bye. You buy first before you see. And those, that particular class of Christian in ladies, they are getting more rare by the day. And the Lord is searching for his own type of people who will wait in the center of his will, unbending, waiting for God's time. When God's timing does come, glory comes with it. Are you with me? Ah, I can talk like David. I've been young. But now I'm getting mature. I've seen men wait and they are honored. Did you hear me? I've seen come at, at, at the time of uh, uh, God's timing, come upon a man and I've seen the honor that comes with it. Hmm? And it's always very fantastic. Very what? I won't mention the name because you all know him. <laughs> One gentleman. He's rocking Christianity somewhere in Nigeria now. His church is growing on a daily basis. We know him. We know he was washing toilets. Maybe somebody has heard this story before. He was washing toilets in a church that's also large. And they will go to him. Is this all you want to do? He said, yeah. This is what the Lord asked me to do for now. Washing what? Do you know what they do in toilet? Huh? Don't just imagine it. They do nasty things in toilet. And when it is church toilet, they do very churchy, nasty things in them. Eh? And these guys watch, washing the nasty church members, whatever, for years. For years. So when he approached his pastor one day, that one said, Are you still washing toilet? Say, Yes. That's where the Lord said, Kneel down. And they said the pastor held his head and prayed until he was weeping. You heard me? The pastor held the man's head. He prayed until tears came from his eyes. Dear Lord, he has been at his duty post for long enough. The pastor was tired of having such quality, washing filth. He cried unto the Lord, the Lord had. And the rest is history. Are you with me? There is Standing in the center of God's will. Number two, there is what? There is obedience which is very necessary. Number three is God's time. All the while you are standing in the center of God's will, Satan will come. 
the major thing hell would do to you when you are in the center of God's will is negotiation. What do I mean by negotiation? Negotiation is the attempt of Satan to take you from the center of God's will by showing you a way that will get what you want to do faster. And he doesn't bend all the rules. He will bend just a bit of it. Just how much? A little bit of it. And if you're willing to bend that little, my friend, you're out of the center. You're out of the center. I used to have this very funny teacher in the Bible school. He said, he pity people who are out of the center of God's will. For their prayers are answered far away from where they are. You don't think it's funny? Let me explain. If where Peter is sitting is God's will for me, if by mistakes, misdemeanors, wrong choices, disobediences, I'm this far away from him, and I'm praying, dear Lord, send a car. A car lands. But where does the car land? It lands there. Uh-uh. Dear Lord, send money. Money lands. Where does the money land? Money, car, favor, strength, all you see clans where you are supposed to be. And so, that's the reason for gnashing of teeth, according to Ray Dias. He said, when you get to heaven and you go to God and say, God, but I ask for a car, the Lord will say, it's there. Uh-huh, so you sent it. And I asked for money. It's in, in there. You say, what about, I sent it. Your problem, son, was, you are not where your goodies are. How will you feel? The Bible call it gnashing of teeth. Timing. Say with me, I wait. Let's say it again. Let's say it again. Show you one little thing here. A scripture you might not like. <laughs> it's in the Deuteronomy chapter 28. I said you won't like it. Do you know people don't like to read the Deuteronomy 28? When they read it, they read from verse 1 to 14. Then they stop. They don't go beyond it. You know the first 14 verses. And blessed shall you be, and blessed shall you be, and blessed shall you be. But from verse 14, from verse 15, he said, hey, cost shall you be, and cost shall you be. So when I was younger, when I'm reading the Tarunumi, oh, to bless it. You want to hear what I do? When you say, cost shall you be, I say, cost shall they be, cost shall they be, cost shall they be. I don't, I don't personalize it. Do you know why? I made up my mind. I won't qualify for this. Because, cost shall they be. Whether you say they or you or my or whatever, it depends on the way you're living. Listen to me, verse 23. Deuteronomy 28, 23. <clears throat> and I want you to just, when you're reading scripture, don't rush. He said, And thy heaven that is over thy head shall be brass, and the earth that is under thee shall be iron. Anybody have another Bible that says it differently? Huh? The, the, the sky over your head shall be bronze. Abi, do you notice he's personalizing it? He didn't say the sky generally shall be bronze. So God come. What, what God is trying to say is, of the big sky, there is your own portion. Are you getting it? Your own portion. It's a big sky, very large sky, but there is your own portion. And when you please me, the sky, your own portion of sky, will be what? Will be open. That was why Isaac planted in a year of famine. And what happened? It brought plenty. Why? Because his own heaven was open. Say with me, may my own heaven be open. Say it like you want it to happen. Say it with conviction. You know what he's saying. From verse 14, he said, but if you choose to disobey me. I like the way he said it. He said, this, your sky. Your sky. That, that space. The window via which favor should pour to you. Is God's own personal window for you. The place open for Peter. In disobedience shall be what? Say shall be bronze. 
shall be bronze. And when it is bronze, the land shall be what? Iron. Who was he talking to? He was talking to farmers. People who keep livestock. What does he spell for a farmer? When his heaven is bronze and his land iron. It's a hard life. Maybe seated. <laughs> As I grew older, there's something I say now. Somebody comes to me a very bad story. Brother Ole, eh, muta tomato, tomato baje, muta yo, ojo pami, ego. Mubani kinta flower, bugu elodi koko. Why, why? Ma wo, mani why? Koye ko leto nye. It ought not to be this hard. There's something you're not telling me. Because even if it is timing, are you listening? I'm going back to timing. Even if it is timing, when you are waiting and it is timing, grace and favor will attend you. Are you with me? When my dear brother Joseph was in prison, do you know why they kept him in prison? He stayed long in prison because it was not time. I can't teach you history. I cannot teach you history. But when he was taken into prison, they were having Egyptian kings. By the time they brought him out of prison, they were having East Coast kings. East Coast kings were not Egyptian. They were not sons of the Pharaoh. They were nomads who took over Pharaoh. Being foreigners themselves, they are open to foreigners. That was why you could say, I will make you my assistant. The king was a foreigner. Joseph was a foreigner, so he could give him power. No Egyptian king can do that. Later on, the Egyptian pharaohs took over from the East Coast again, and the Bible says, there came a king who did not know Joseph. It's not as if he did not know Joseph. He's just not of the foreign, and he wanted to exterminate all foreigners. God timed it. God timed it. But when you are in prison, waiting for God's time, Grace and favor will attend to you. The Bible says Joseph prospered in prison. How do you prosper in prison? But then, you prosper in prison. There is not enough food for everybody, but you are the one sharing it. Egbo? Egbo? There is not enough food for everybody. You are 50, they give you food for 45. Huh? And you are giving them half, half. And you are explaining to them, you know, prospering in prison. He had favor from all the authority of the prison. He prospered in Potiphar's house while waiting. He prospered in prison while waiting. When you are prospering while waiting, it means the only thing delaying you is time. And when the time is fulfilled, the heavens will open. God is now claiming, when you see the heavens are shot against you, I'm the one who shot it. Who shot the heavens? And how can we open it again? How do we get a short heaven reopened? The only thing is, go back to the areas of disobediences and begin to live obediently. Don't ever, I'm closing, not because it's finished, but because we'll continue later on. Don't ever, don't ever think a sin is too small. Are you li- listening to me? Don't ever imagine God did not notice. I told you a long time ago, I said, God like transparent people. Ensure that before you are reported, you report yourself. Hmm? And let the heavens know that you are willing to make a redress. Don't live the careless life of somebody who sees wrongs go by and you don't talk to God about it. No. How will you like it if I take your car 
I bash it. I return it. I pack it. The bash is there. I'm the one who drove it. I'm not talking about it. I say nothing. How will you like it? But if I come and say, Peter, when I took your car out, a downfall driver hit me to the back. What are you likely to say? It's all right. Our father is a very, very understanding person. He knows your frailty. Jesus was in the flesh before. He knows the weaknesses of man. But he doesn't like you to do what you do. To do nasty, silly, little human things and try he does not see. No, he does see. That's why he said, come, let us what? Let's reason together. I saw you. Did I tell you of my foolishness when I was eating my mother's meat? And my mother would come and we were praying and she would say, Taloji Eranje. And I would not say anything. And she would say, Wugualo, did you? But my mother does not close her eyes. I didn't know she was lying there. She didn't close her eyes. She said, oh, all eyes are closed. Then I will raise my ginger little hand. I go this way. And I put my hand down. Then when we finish praying, she will now call me. Wale walu I will say no. <laughs> because I didn't know she her eyes are open. You are, you are the one. I said, I did it. I never touched your pot. Then she will bring out the koboko. And she will tell me this. It's not the meat you ate. It's a lie. That I can't forget it. I've done it to my children too. It's not what you did. It's the fact that you're calling me a fool. You're making it look like I don't have eyes. But I do. I do. You know, you send some money to somebody I won't mention here. <laughs> but we opened the account for him earlier. So his mother received a lot. On his birthday, 9,000 ran out of the account. Going. Mm-hmm. Then POS, food at social place. POS, POS. Until one day the mother called me. Your son has only 400 naira in his account. So I went there. It was looking like this when I saw him. You know when you finish your money, then you eat air. <laughs> it was in that particular position when he was eating air. When I saw my son, he was looking at me. I said, okay, what happened? He said, nothing. How are you? He said, fine. How come you now have 400 naira in your account? He said, he doesn't know what happened to the money. Ah, nah. <laughs> That, that, <laughs> that is a problem. If you are able to tell me what happened to the money, I will give you more. They started looking at the floor. You don't know what happened to the money. I know. 9,000 your back day. I felt like God. You know how you feel? I know all of his secrets. You know, they are giving us a lot. Back day, 9,000. And I said to 10 times feeding with POS. And one day, 1,750. How many of your friends did you take there? Daddy, daddy, uh uh-huh. Now you know that I know. I can now help you. Because we're on the same page. You know, I brought him until the time where tears in the big boy's eyes. And I can be tough. No food for you. And I won't allow you to stay in school. So you won't die. I'm taking you home now. And you're going to stay at home until Peter will send you your next allowance. Oh, we have this tomorrow, eh? So what happened to the money? That I made a mistake. I didn't spend. Uh-huh. And since you now know you made a mistake, I brought out my purse. Take money. Be careful next time. But when you're there, trying to pretend to him that those things are not there, he to pull you back into the center of his will. And when you are not in the center of his will, believe me, the heavens can never open. So help me pray to somebody. Say, go back to God. Say it again. When the heavens are opened, demons can't stay there. When the heavens are opened, your enemies can't exist. 
When the heavens are opened, things that are difficult now are easy. May the heavens above you be opened. Amen. Shall we bow our hearts to pray? And talk to God about the heavens. I just want you to set your accounts with the Father if you can. Set your accounts. And in a short while I will ask all of us to stand up. And pray together as a body. Two or three prayer points. But first, I want us to settle accounts. Are there issues between you and your father? Things that he's been speaking about before? Areas of your life that needs attention? I want to talk to him? stand I want us to pray three prompt prayer one prayer three prompts let the heavens let my heavens above my head be open may the heavens above my head be open the second prayer is may the heavens above my family be open you pray it for yourself as an individual pray it for your family and pray it for the nation those are the three prayer points your own way. Then I'll call Brad Peter to pray them. We'll close. But number one, may the heavens, my heavens, not a general thing, may my heavens above my head, may they be opened. My heavens. I like personalizing it. May my heavens above my head, may they be opened. May grace alight upon me. May favor alight upon me. May your strength be made available for the labors of my life. Dear Lord, if I have strayed from the center of your will, please draw me back. Dear Lord, if I have moved because of your delay, Take me back. Correct whatever you have to correct there, Father. Straighten whatever is crooked. But please let the heavens above my head. Let my heavens above my head be open. every man here to stand up. It's a, it's a prayer for the, the, the women can support us. Oh, but every man pray for the heavens above your family to open. Let our wives support us. Let mothers support their children. Uh, I really, really don't want a woman to say it now. May the heavens above my family. 
begin to pray for your husband. May the heavens above my husband's head let it be opened. Oh, that a woman will pray today for her husband like a woman laboring, calling on God to open the heavens above him. He's your head. Oluwase fi si mi lokan ni e pe ki awon iyawo kan ma kan ma ro bi fun oko won to intercede for your husband asking that the lord will tear open this heaven above his head at this point i want children to pray for their father if you are still under your daddy you see eating in his house pray for him This time I want all of us to lift our voice and cry for this nation. That our national heaven will open. That our national heaven will open. that you would ring the heaven and come down let the heavens open above our nation that's our prayer let the heavens of nigeria open above her in mercy in grace lift the voice as we sing that song the floor games in the abundance and cause your rain to fall on us open the floor
upon every man, upon every woman, upon every family here represented. We ask that the heavens above us will open. Hey, help us, dear Father, to be obedient to your instruction. Help us, dear Lord, that we will not stray away from the center of your will. Enable our hearts, dear Father, to follow through with your will. Whether it's convenient or not, as long as it is what you demand of us, enable us, dear Father, to obey your word. Thank you, our dear Father. Thank you for your word you've sent to us this morning. We bless you for the heart with which we've received it. We trust you, dear Lord, that your word will begin to have an impact in our life and produce fruit unto righteousness to the glory and honor of your holy name. Thank you, mighty Father. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Shall we sit there for a while? 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 There for a while?